Well, hey, thank you, uh, thank you all so much for being here. I know it's a holiday weekend, <laughs> yeah, I know. but uh, excited to you know be around all of you and to share a little bit about um, what I have for today. So what we've done before is the first uh, the first alchemy talk that I did here was just on alchemy in general, like the sort of some of the sort of the basic elements of alchemy, like the three things that make a uh, transformative process actually an uh, alchemical process. And just kind of was ju just a general introduction. And then I did three on that whole tablet. And this today what we're uh, talking about is alchemy and psychology. And uh, one of the things that was actually really great about everything kind of being kind of postponed from last week to this week is I was you know, going, going home last, last week and I realized the talk was originally about alchemy and psychology that, that, that alchemy influenced psychology and certain elements of it. And I realized that really what it is, is it's about a model. Is early alchemy, the model of alchemy, all the piece of, pieces and parts and how they relate the images, the language, it's a model. And that's really was adopted by early psychology. So uh, for myself, I'm always interested in um, you know, different ways of modeling processes and different ways of representing things. And especially when there's really rich uh, imagery like this, it's, it's, uh, it gets your imagination going, there's just something especially magical about that. Okay, so uh, in terms of alchemy, as I mentioned, I believe it was in the first one, you know, when you read, you know, people that are, that are into mysticism and uh, metaphysics and spirituality, a lot of times they'll be really interested in, in uh, alchemy. Um, but sort of the widespread opinion, as I said before, about alchemy is that it's sort of antiquated or old or superstitious. I mean, not, not us here, but like I said, the general population might think, oh, it's not people trying to turn lead into gold or, or whatever it is. They might, they might seem antiquated to some people, to like just the general population. And I feel like one of the reasons for that, and one of the reasons why it's especially important to, to study that now, is that we sort of live in a throwaway culture. We work with Oh, this one. This is old. We're gonna pitch it, get the new thing. Um, you know, we don't have cobblers reselling shoes so much. You know, it's just cheaper to get a new pair. But it, you know, at the same time, it's really important to work with sort of ancient knowledge and ancient practices of transformation. And alchemy is really one of the best ones that's out there. And also, too, as I'm gonna talk about today, alchemy as a model for early the early development of uh, psychotherapy and psychology. Uh, it's really useful, and part of the reason why I'm doing this series is people to say, well, that's great for psychology, but what else could we use it for? You know, to say it's a it was a model for the early development of that, so what else could we possibly use it for? Okay, so at the time that alchemy, sort of the early chemistry was alchemy, and then when the development of the periodic table happened, there was sort of this shift of saying, okay, well, that's the old antiquated way of working with it, and we don't have to look about the, the red line and this dragon and this thing. We've got this grid that's a periodic table. And they started discovering elements and fitting it into the grid pattern. And that's great. There's so many amazing innovations and things that have come from the periodic table. And I'm not here to minimize any of that. But I'm just saying, look at the richness and imagery of that versus a grid. I mean, this is very important too. I mean, of course. But in terms of richness, you can see that and you can work with it your whole life, and you can go back to it, or Azoth, or certain other images, you can go back to it, and at a certain point you'll see things in it you've never seen before. So it's layered, it's a rich model, versus something that's this, is powerful, and it's clear, and it's useful. But there's, there's no layers in this, as there's layers in that. Um, and then one thing that was kind of interesting that, uh, that came up is, the uh, August, uh, August uh, Kukule, Kukule, Kukule. I, uh, <laughs> you know, most of my life people have been mispronouncing my last name. It's it's Reimers. Half the time I get uh, Reimers. <laughs> Since moving to LA, occasionally I get a Ramirez. But uh, you know, so I'm always kind of you know mindful of okay, please don't butcher other people's names and, and stuff like that. And a lot of times in restaurants, I'll like say. I like the number four instead of <laughs> butchering whatever <laughs> food name. I mean, except for Thai food. If you can order something called a rat nar, it's, you just say it because it's too fun not to. I mean, Thai, Thai food is the funnest 
you know, the names of the dishes are more fun than any other culture, I think. So anyway, this, I uh, apologize for the most pronunciation of it is, uh, but August Pikule, that's how you pronounce it, he had a daydream. He was working with, he was one of those people who was familiar with certain elements of alchemy. He was one of the early sort of modern chemists. And he was in this sort of daydream sort of reverie, and he saw the Ouroboros, and he was working with a problem about chemical structure, about how bonds form and these things like this, and that's benzene. He had the, he, he, was, he was working with this problem, and the pieces couldn't all fit together, and he wasn't sure how it was, and then it was his deep unconscious, or the collective unconscious, that came, and he had the image of the Ouroboros. Mm -hmm. And he saw, it's it's a it's a chain of carbon with uh, you know single bonds of, of hydrogen that's benzene and that the Ouroboros that alchemical symbol started solved that problem and that led to people uh, showing the structure of these chemical bonds so that's sort of the neat crossover between alchemy and modern chemistry. So as I mentioned before, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. I mean, he so much that he'd done in, in terms of uh, math and, and physics. And as we know here, uh, most of his books, his library, was on alchemy. He did his own uh, original translation of the Emerald Tablet. <laughs> uh, he was so, his, you know, uh, for example, like I love uh, the I Ching, I love multiple other books, and I have multiple translations, say for like, I think, like 14 versions of it, to see different shadings of meaning from each of the translators, so I can sort of, sort of feel the original of it. But I've never translated it. I've never learned <laughs> Chinese and and, uh, and translated it. But he cared so much about the Emerald Tablet and alchemy. He actually learned it. He did his own translation, and he posted it and kept referring to that. And he, like I said, he had more books on alchemy than than math or, or physics. But through that deep understanding and that deep mystical foundation, he could reach what no one else had reached up to that point and pulled it to the surface and formulate it in terms of math and principles. Okay, and uh, you know Sigmund Freud. Honestly, I really love Jung, his work. I'm not a huge fan of Freud's, just full disclosure. But um, there's some there's some good stuff that he came up with that I appreciate that I will share. Um, but even even the fact that you can say, okay, well Jung definitely was was into metaphysical and the, the collective unconscious and all of these sort of more, more mystical metaphysical concepts, where you can say, well, how is Freud into that? Uh, but as I'll share, a lot of the early um, concepts that were that were as the psychology and psychotherapy was being formulated that Freud was using, and some of his key concepts were coming from alchemy. And uh, Jung went so far as to say he said that alchemy is probably the best single model out there for his psychotherapy, his version of, of the psyche and transformation. And he actually even said that he felt that his work after, and if you've ever read the Red Book and certain other things he's put out there. Um, that he felt that his work was that actually a branch and a continuation of alchemy. Like he actually considered what he did a branch and a continuation of the tradition of alchemy, which is pretty, pretty significant, it's pretty powerful. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the alchemy as a model. So a model of psychology and early psychotherapy. And you know, looking at the, the idea of a model, um, so like the definition of it is, it's something you take that's smaller in scale or complexity. So here's a, here's a building. It's going to be a big apartment building that sits on a desk. They build a model so they can really look and understand it on a small level to apply it to a larger level. And uh, <laughs> uh, when I was doing you know, image research and finding images for my slides, of course, when I'm looking for <laughs> the, looking up like model, that's not the first <laughs> so, you know, so. Or if you look up rich model, it's even further down that other same road I'm not looking for. You know, and it's like I live in LA and I am obsessed with models, but not the not the models of most people here obsessed with it. But I love like looking at models of processes and metaphysical things, especially those models that are based on alchemy, uh, physiology, and sacred geometry are the one, ones that I feel like have the most richness to them. So Let's look at just a couple elements of a model. So one of the things about a model is that there's parts that interrelate. They'll have like a, a, like a flow chart or a diagram. They'll have this, this piece, this piece, these bubbles with arrows or, or whatever it is. 
or there's like a, a pyramid, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, and it'll show how they interrelate. So they're images, but there's also words. So models are always imagery based with words, because you have to have images and you have to have a form, a flow, how they interrelate. You also have to have words to show how they, how they relate to each other. And one of the things I think was really interesting is when I was uh, recently looked, revisiting Maslow's, uh, you know, the, the pyramid, of, it goes from like, if you look at it, it's sort of like the, the fundamental needs are like food, shelter, like survival-based things, and then it gets up to physical comfort, then it gets up to emotional, then it gets up to things like self-actualization. If you look at that, that mirrors the brain. So if you look at the brain stem, you start at the base of the brain, that's your pulse, that's your respiration, that's all the automatic functions that have to happen to keep you alive. Then it gets up to the sort of the, the limbic system, which is the emotional brain, and all the, the emotional hormonal responses to emotion. And then when you get up to the neocortex, that's abstract thought. That actually follows this exactly. So if you look at it, it's instinctual, emotional, and intellectual. Instinctual, emotional, and intellectual. And you know, it's funny too because like any sort of uh, authentic growth model or growth map, it's it transcends and it includes. It doesn't throw away the lower part. It doesn't judge the lower to say, oh, you're lower and basic and kick it out. It's, an, it's essential, it's the ground that it all builds from. You know, because with self-actualization, if you get up to self-actualization, you don't have this in place, you don't have a pulse, <laughs> you won't be actualized for long. <laughs> you will realize you are actually not alive anymore. Um, so, <laughs> but, but also too, it's, it's, you can see it's a natural principle. Like look at the ocean. The ocean, there's heavy uh, rock and then sand and sedimentary stuff. Then water is more subtle and air above that is more subtle than water. So it's like more coarse to, to more subtle. It's a scale. So a lot of these models will have that in it. Like if it's an authentic growth process, it'll have the more coarse to the more subtle, or it'll have the simple, and it'll expand out where it's continuing evolving. It'll transcend and include all those layers that are below it. It's not judging, it's not picking them out and not throwing it. It's not saying, oh, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, I, I was like childlike and I would play all the time or whatever, and then say that's, that's not valuable because that's part of our imagination and that's part of how we learn. That's still within us. So it's important to know that those levels are valuable and it's not something to be thrown out. It's something we build on, that we grow from. It's literally the ground that we're walking on. Whatever level we get to, it's that ground level that we, we continue to build on. And each level builds on the one before it. Okay, so how is it especially important to have a you know, rich model for psychology and psychotherapy? So in looking at this and kind of preparing for this talk, I was realizing, uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist. I do have three certifications, NLP, um, and that, that's, what I, that's part of what I do. Um, so I have that perspective, but I, ha I don't have the real foundation in psychotherapy. But what I noticed that's interesting is in, in talk therapy, really what's happening is there, someone has an issue that's within them. A lot of it might be unconscious material that's within them they're not even aware of. What happens is they express it to somebody and then they reflect it back. Well, if you look at language, uh, language you can express things in the first person, second person, or third person. So the first person is, I have this challenge. Second person is, you have this challenge. And the third person is, they have this mm -hmm. challenge or situation. So what's happening is, you're taking something from the first person to the second person to the third person through a talking process. It's like a, a talk, talk therapy, or even just talking with a friend, if they can reflect it back to you. Because what happens is, someone is feeling all of this internal stuff. They might, they're, they're aware of some of it, maybe not aware of others other aspects. That's purely first person. When you talk to somebody else, that moves that your experience to the second person. You're relating it to another person. So that's that's more objective. That's second person. And then the third person, if that good friend who's you're you're sharing stuff with, if they reflect back to you stuff back to you, say, oh did you hear where you said have to? It's really you choose to. You don't have to and they might say, oh yeah, I never thought of that because they're reflecting it back to you, and that's now third person. It's an objective thing. So in terms of 
the early talk therapy, early psychotherapy, they're really looking at how can we get this, this material, these problems, these, these kind of murky internal things that might be like nebulous and hard to understand, hard to really clearly perceive, and how can we really perceive it clearly, because you have to be able to perceive it clearly to, to change it. I mean, it's like a surgeon uh, working in the dark. You know, you have to see it clearly before you can really see what needs to be changed and then do things and then see if that works. So looking at alchemy as a solution or a, or a resource for these challenges is there's externalized and clear images. So an image like that or the image of like the, the, um, uh, the this first slide or Azoff, any of these other ones, they are really clear images. And a lot of times we might feel something, but we can't really put a word to it or put an image to it. It's just a feeling. But when we see certain imagery like this, that's that's like rich or it like evokes feeling, or it, it triggers. Oh, I remember I had this dream one time. It it triggers these things. When you have rich layered imagery, it pulls that out. So the early psychotherapy was looking at how can we help people pull this out and uh, objectify it internal, and how can we have a model that they essentially will connect with, that they can sort of bring internal as they, as they continue to think about it and reflect on it. So uh, externalized and clear, layered meanings, memorable, like it could, it could stick in your mind. One of the things about a really clear image, it's sort of like if you uh, hear a really great song, or especially if you have a question you don't have an answer for, as I taught in one of the earlier ones, that positive, negative, polarity, questions and answers. If you have a paradox or a puzzle or something that you're working with, you just don't have the answer, it tends to stick in your mind. And images like that and other really deep alchemical images will tend to take hold and, and stick in the mind. Just like if you have a question, if you stay with the question long enough and sit with it long enough, you can, uh, it'll generate, pull the resources to it. If you have, if you're working through a tremendous transformational process and you have to see the right archetypal image, and it's sort of connecting with what you would know, call the collective unconscious or your deep unconscious or whatever uh, within yourself. And then that can help sort of crystallize it and, and give you a language and an image to put to that feeling or that impression that you have inside. So another area where, the, uh, in terms of uh, models and psychotherapy and psychology and alchemy, is the idea of uh, a, a hierarchy. So in alchemy, there's the idea of the subtle and the gross. As I said in the earlier talk, there's the x, y axis. There's like the levity and gravity, like gravity and, le and levity. There's the gross and then there's the subtle. So there's this idea in alchemy and this, this process of getting to a more refined state, of refining whatever material there is. And what developed in psychology and psychotherapy, especially growth psychology, is this stage conception. Where uh, you know there's you know Piaget and, and other ones. There's ones that are very complex. There's ones that are really simple. Uh, say for example, like you know selfish care and then universal care, where someone just is concerned with their own physical body and then care for certain their family and people close to them, and then it gets to embracing more of humanity and more life on Earth in general. So like these nested things where it's like it transcends and includes the stage before. So that was unique to alchemy, that's that gross to subtle. And that ended up uh, sort of, in a sense, getting adopted by the branch of psychology that worked with like developmental lines and developmental stages. OK, so another thing about this is that with, with alchemy is uh, you know, modeling a process that works. There's a lot of natural archetypal patterns that are out there. You could say, well, you know, how does this, how does nature solve it, or how does uh, this tradition solve it. How does this tradition work with transformation, or how does this this um, this tool or this uh, group of people work with transformation? And you can see what they're doing, and you can take it apart, sort of model it, and understand what is it that makes what they're doing work, and you can sort of create a simplified model, just like the the, the miniaturized building on the desk. You can see what works and apply the principles. And um, you know, it's really interesting to like to look and try different things out and see if you can abstract what it is that makes something work, and then test it out, and then see if you can get the same <coughs> results. And if you get the same results, then you've successfully modeled it. Okay, so the next area is resonance. 
as I mentioned before, <coughs> if you have a really strong in external uh, symbol or image or whatever that resonates with you internally, that will stick with you, that will stay with you, and will help you make sense of your internal world. And with this, what it is, is it's seeking to take this sort of cloudy, unclear internal states and challenges and, and different things happening, different dynamics happening inside, and move that out to make that more objective. At the same time, we want these objective forms to be able to move in. So it's these alchemical symbols, these processes, these like rich layered uh, images that will take hold. People will see it, and then later on it'll trigger things, and it'll trigger revelations. And, <coughs> and resonance is all about this thing and this thing being so similar enough that they they communicate, that they resonate with each other. There's, there's information or energy that's passed back and forth. So if you can take someone's internal world and make that more objective, and take these objective maps and make it rich enough that they can really feel an impact of it, then you've got resonance, you've got communication between the internal and the external. And it's all about, you know, the trigger, about having that sort of be the seed, like planting a seed that can grow to, you know, get it into the person's, uh, you, know, you know, conscious mind, but also non-conscious mind to help you know, be a seed to trigger change and um, trigger realization. Okay, so we talked about models. So modeling, you have images and you have the parts, but you have to name the parts. So the other aspect of models always involves language. So now we're going to talk about the language adopted. So one of the things that's really interesting is, and we just back up here, is that with uh, with psychology. Um, there's the app. Hold on one second. Okay, so I just want to back up to this one part just to touch on this one more time. So we have images and we have the pieces and parts, but we also have a unique and specialized language. That's what we're going to get into now. There's terms and acronyms. So say, for example, um, if someone is working with, uh, with sort of uh, the bigger challenges, there might be ADHD, or oh, this person's labeled ADD. So there's specific, you know, attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Any of these things, uh, they you need to develop a specific language to stand for these certain things. And then the more you use them, the more you might need to compress them into acronyms. So systems always have images, and they always have specialized language usually, and especially acronyms if you are doing a lot of discussing about a certain topic. All right, so I just want to touch on it one more time to get a little bit deeper before we get into this. Okay, so separation. So when I was doing the talk on the Emerald Tablet, stage, so stage three is uh, separation in the Azoc and uh, the Emerald Tablet. In psychology, separation was talking about separation, especially in terms of trauma. So it is about separation anxiety it's for special, especially. So like it is a sort of a vulnerable part in the uh, growth process. If you're separated, separating from a parent, separating from a loved one, um, you might have the death of a loved one. That's a type of separation, and that causes its own emotional response. So separation has been adopted by psychology as one of the areas to, to focus on. And But also, too, even the process of, like I mentioned before, about dialogue and talk therapy, about being able to step back, about reflect, if you have someone, you're talking to someone, sharing with your with someone your, your issues, what, what you're challenged with, and they reflect back to you, you can then see it objectively, and you can then take the pieces of behavior or elements that are that are helpful to you, and you can say, oh, well, these these patterns or these behaviors are not helpful. Really, what I need to focus on is is focusing on these areas. That's actually separation in the alchemical sense, it's like Azoff, like. You know, the, the castination, dissolution, and then separation. You're basically separating the subtle from the dross. You know, you're looking at what's valuable versus not what's valuable. And you're saying, okay, let's let the stuff that's not valuable go and focus on what is valuable. So even just the process of dialogue with someone, talk therapy, or just with a friend who's reflecting back to you can help you get to this point of, se of, of separation where you can separate different elements and see what's most valuable to you and use most and keep most of what's valuable and find a way to let go of stuff that's not certain. Okay, so just a couple questions. You don't need to go too deep with this today, but I always think that there's a momentum that when you when you 
first hear something or first think of something, if you capture it and start to create something with it, it can continue to happen you know, on a, a deeper level, you know, like non-conscious level. So if you look, the first question is, uh, where, uh, you know, where have I experienced separation anxiety? So just, you don't have to go too deep with this, but just take a minute and you can just jot down um, in your life, like what, do you have a memory of separation or any kind of thing that's, that's uh, emotionally difficult? And if you have that, I'll just give you a minute for that. And then uh, you can basically say, how can I use separation more skillfully in my life? But what that is, is that separation more in the sort of the hermetic sense of like separating yourself, letting yourself be separated from these, you know, these things that might might be distraction, it might be things that aren't constructive, whatever it is. But just take a minute. I'll give you a minute just to, to write uh, those, uh, just even a even a couple words, just to start that process. And like I said, even just a couple words will sort of be the beginning of that process, kind of seed that that line of thought. Okay, so the next stage is um, fusion. So in Aesop, uh, you know, the, the uh, conjunction, you have the separation and the conjunction. You separate the elements and then you, you put them back together. After you've separated out what's, what's useful for the next stage of the transformation and what isn't, you put the stuff together, you, you fuse it, you, you, it's conjunction, you put it back together. Um, also, in uh, any kind of alchemical process that's involving metals, it can be alloy or amalgamation of metals, where you're fusing metals together. Uh, so psychotherapy have used this term in terms of uh, cognitive fusion. And what that is, is attaching uh, emotion to an experience. So you have an experience that might be neutral, and then you have your emotional response to it. What, what they talk about fusion is, is you're saying, this equals this. So maybe talking, public speaking might equal fear, or trying something new might equal excitement, you know. So you can do it for negative or positive in ways that will empower you to do more and expand more, or you can do it in ways that might hold you back. So it's useful to look at what your associations are to things. How do you use fusion, either consciously or unconsciously? And you can actually intentionally give things a new meaning if you'd like to use fusion in a direct and conscious way. You could say, well, I'd really love to attach excitement and adventure to trying new things when you realize, oh, a lot of times I've been attaching fear and anxiety to stepping into new things. And say, that's really been holding me back. So how can I change my association? So the best way to do that is pick something small enough that's new that you say, oh, that might be really interesting. And you do that new thing. And as soon as you do that and you have an experience, you might focus on the positive aspect of that. And that might start growth in a new way. You're starting to live experience where you are fusing a new, a new emotional quality and a new state with that activity. So something you'd like to do, like like travel, maybe you know the, the idea of of losing stuff or losing a passport or losing this or the, maybe that has kept you back from travel. But if you can start small and then you can make sure you give yourself good experiences from that, you'll start using fusion in a positive, conscious way, fusing curiosity and excitement, and growth and, and challenge. In a, in a positive way with the adventure, adventure of travel. Um, so also too, uh, confusion with psychology and psychotherapy has also been used in terms of combining the social self and the uh, and the, uh, the personal self. So say for example, a lot of times if they use, people use the term I am, like I am vegetarian or I am vegan or whatever it is, anytime someone uses I am with something, a lot of times what happens is fusion is happening. So someone is taking part of a group or a way of being as part of their being. And that can be positive, but a lot of times it, it can actually be more limiting than positive because any change of that identity, so say for example, if someone said, I am a raw foodist or whatever, if your body is ever gonna ask for something that's not raw, then if you used your identity to the idea of being a raw, a raw foodist or someone who eats raw food, then that's a totally, you know, there's so many great benefits in doing that. But say, for example, if you use your identity to say, I am a raw Buddhist, if your body is ever asking for something else, you most likely will resist it because you'll feel like your identity 
that a change to that label is a change to your identity and like a threat to yourself or yourself, you know, on a deep level might feel like a threat to your existence, you know, so it's, it's, you can use it in a positive way, just like the other aspect of it, but it's just useful to know how are you using it, you know, are you using it in a way that's, that's going to contribute more to your life, or are you doing it in a way that's sort of holding yourself back, just being aware of how you're using fusion. Okay, so just a couple of quick questions here. Um, so what ways have I uh, fused my identity uh, with a uh, group? So anytime you say, I am a, uh, and then you have a group, you, you've used fusion to some extent. And it's useful to reflect on that. And then how have I used uh, positive and negative you know, associations uh, with things? So it's useful to just, if you don't have to write, you know, just even a couple words, just capture just a little bit of it. But you can start to capture just a little bit if you just kind of step back. Like I said, the first person, second person, third person, step back and get some objectivity to say, oh, that's right, you know, I, I feel like I am a vegetarian or I am a vegan or I am a raw food or I am a whatever. So you won't allow yourself to, you know, to, if your body is telling you something else, you might resist it because you're like, I have to maintain my identity or I have to maintain my, myself. So it's useful to look at your associations for behaviors, but also ways of, you know, sort of like um, cultural level too. So I'll just give you like a, a minute, even if you jot down a couple words. Can I? Yes. That's that's question we have to answer. You can. Uh, uh, you know, and I'm gonna have the recording too. So uh, you know, it's one of those things where you you know you can just on your own you can just jot down a couple words if you'd like. You yeah. know. Like any, especially the, oh, the I, the right. yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, right yeah. Now. yeah, so if you I just jot it down, yeah, oh, I feel <laughs> we need to answer by talking. Oh, no, no, it's okay, yeah, just, so just jot it down, so, you know, I just want, because everyone's going to have their own individual response, okay. so it's just a matter of, you know, just getting a sense of how, what have you identified with, what groups or what ways of being have you identified with, and you can say what, what are the positives and what are the limitations of that. And then what activities like like travel or doing something new or public speaking or whatever it is. And then you can see what have I how have I used fusion? What have I what emotional qualities have I assumed? Have I associated with a certain activity? So I'll just give you a couple minutes. And like I said, I am recording this too, so you can also look at these questions later. I'll be posting this in the, the, the Facebook. Yeah, and even if you just wanted to jot down the question and have them for later, you know, sometimes you might want to sit with them for a little bit and then see what comes, uh, what pops to mind. The other option too is if there is some activity or some behavior, you say, I'd really like to do that, but I just don't do it. Why don't I do it? That's another way to, to filter through and find your associations. Like, uh, I just, I just really, you know, I really would like to go and try new things or try new restaurants or just, you know, it's like the lowest scale version of travel. Like, I'm not going to the other world. I just want to go across town and get something different to eat, you know. It's like, maybe people don't even do that. And you might say, well, maybe I, uh, I just don't have the energy or I'm just too busy. And it's like, well, then you fuse the idea of going across town and getting, just sitting down and having someone make food for you at some other place. You fuse that with the feeling of being overwhelmed or fuse that with the idea of, oh, there's too much time or whatever it is, versus fusing it with the idea of, oh, I can see a new part of town, or I can meet new people, or I can eat at this place, or I can get a group of friends together to say, hey, let's let's all go together and do something, and you'll be together hanging out in some context or way that you haven't before. So it's really useful to look at this about you know fusion and your associations to things. Because, and like I said, if you know sort of a, a hot button issue, you can look at your association, but if you just sort of have a feeling of, I'd really like to do something different, but what's what's the thing I'd like to do? You can you can sort of follow the breadcrumb to say, well, maybe something about dance, take a dance class, or eat something different, or, or or whatever it is. And you can say, well, why am I not doing that? You can say, well, I wouldn't want to do that because of this. And then you can find what you're what you fused, how you've used fusion, how you fused an association to that activity. So it's just useful to to look at. Okay, so the next one is condensation. 
So that is really similar to an Emerald Tablet and as of you know, the earlier talk we talked about uh, in coagulation. There's like that, that separating out and then the gathering together. So uh, what this means is, uh, you know, in, in like psychology is when a single idea or image stands for multiple things or associations. So say for example, like the image, uh, some, some deep image might mean one thing in one context, another thing in another context. It's like a rich image that just has a lot of meaning to it, that they may or may not conflict with each other, but it has layered meaning. And this is, this is pretty simple. So uh, what are the richest images and most potent images in my life? Is there any kind of recurring image or recurring theme or like you know, seed symbol that keeps happening in your life that has different meanings? And if so, you don't have to answer the whole question, but if you just write the question and just thought it cold, any thought you might have that um, looking at what are the symbols, what are the images, and what are the associations, what have you, what meaning you attached to it? Okay, the next one is fixation. So fixation, and we have Azov, there's a couple different of chemical maps and, and uh, process um, flows that, that are out there. Uh, so according to Samuel Norton on chemical stage five, he uh, talked about fixation. And fixation, it's really similar to coagulation from Azov, but what it means in this context, specifically fixation, is moving from a state of high volatility to, uh, high volatility to stability. So it's, it's this, this certain process of working with the material so it becomes less and less volatile and more stable and more kind of inert and more solid. So that's uh, Samuel Norton stage five. In fixation, in terms of psychotherapy and the, the psychology, uh, Freud used it in terms of uh, fixation, um, of, of obsession. He basically said, you know, if someone has an oral fixation or whatever fixation they have, that they have a lack of gratification at a certain earlier stage of development and as a result, they become obsessed with it later in life. So, uh, with the integral model, that's one of my one of the, the models that I keep going back to. The integral um, integral theory, integral model of growth, development, you know, metaphysics, spirituality, all that stuff. Uh, Ken Wilber is one of the ones, who, one of the key people who's really developed and um, gotten a lot, uh, spread the integral model a lot. Uh, the integral model is all about transcending and including. Like I said, there's. There's selfish care, universal care, in, in terms of the, the real simple, you know, um, free phase human development and personal evolution. So basically, uh, in the integral model, it's all about transcending and including. So like you transcend and include. So earlier, like reptilian life, you have the reptilian brain. Then you transcend and include that for mammals, and then humans transcend and include that within the neocortex. So you transcend. And include you build on what was there before, and you you expand it and take it to new places. So with the integral model, is that if you have a fixation, you haven't transcended that thing. If you have an aversion, you haven't included it. You've sort of like an aversion or an allergy, for example, or maybe not like a physical allergy, but sort of like a an energetic allergy or psychology, you know, a psychological allergy. Say for example, you just can't handle people who are impatient or you can't handle when people are angry, then that's an aversion. I mean, there's natural aversion. It doesn't feel great to be sitting there having someone scream in your face. But I'm not talking about that. I'm saying you can't handle it. You have to get away from it. You flee from that energy. You can't handle that energy. That's aversion. So any of these things, if you can see it as just energy, you can see it as just consciousness, you can sort of get to the point where you can transcend and include it. You can accept that that exists. You can hang with it. You can be OK with it. But you've, you've moved beyond it. You're not fixated on it. You're not holding it because you feel lack of it. But you're also not um, you're also not averse to it. So it's about transcending and including. You you allow it to be, but then you move beyond it and you sort of envelop it to the next uh, stage of growth. Okay. So uh, what are my uh, fixations and aversions? Like what are the the subjects? What are the emotional qualities? What are the types of energy? What are the things that I can't stand? And then what are the, are there any things that I get obsessed with? And like I said, fixations are lack of transcending 
and aversion is lack of inclusion. So it's all about transcending and including. So what are my what are my um, fixations and aversions? You just might want to write that question down. This is something to, to keep in mind. And then uh, the next thing is how has my personal history, uh, you know, led to you know the you know the, the people in my life, you know, in terms of the fixation and aversion. How has the personal history played into that? So look at the fixations and aversions, and then your personal history. How how could that grown out of your personal history? Maybe you had a parent who was angry all the time. So either you fixate and are angry all the time too, or you refuse to ever ever express anger and you bottle it up. So just that's sort of the key to these two. Is production. So, has anyone ever seen the Ripley scroll? Ripley scroll. Uh, the first time I saw it was at the Rosicrucian. I actually went to take an alchemy workshop at the Grand Lodge in San Jose, and I went and I saw the the, alchemy, the Rosicrucian Alchemy Museum. And the Ripley scroll is this beautiful, amazing just scroll where it shows all these these elements of, and stages of transformation. And alchemy is purely imagery, and it's really beautiful. It's really amazing. So, uh, George Ripley. Uh, he calls them gates, the different uh, chemical gates. So he, he talks about um, he talks about projection. In his series, and it's instead of seven stages, it's twelve gates. He has as the final gate, the final stage is twelve in his his system, and that's sort of creator creation of the greater stone. And that would either be a, a subtle stone form or a subtle powder. But in his system is that has been achieved when that is at a certain energetic or chemical state, that that can then raise the vibration and the state of other things. That's his qualification for creation of the greater stone, or the greater, whatever, what he would call the greater stone, is that can that then transform other things? Is that have the potential to raise other things? Okay, so uh, one of the ways in using projection, how that's been used with uh, psychology, especially with shadow work, for anyone who does shadow work, I highly encourage, that's one of the most important things I think anyone can, can work with regularly your shadow work, is um, disowning difficult emotions. Just like I said, the whole thing of like, you know, fixation or aversion. A lot of times if you get into the aversion side of it, then if you have are strongly averse to certain emotions, you refuse to ever be angry, you refuse to ever be impatient, you might really have the feeling that you can never show impatience, you can never show anger, so it's suppressed. But as a result, to get that bottled up energy there, someone who work, who uses a lot of projection will, will need to see the rest of the world as angry, or see the rest of the world as impatient. So they, they bottle it up, but then will trigger that emotional response with other people to say, oh, everyone's so angry, everyone's so impatient, everyone needs to relax, where they themselves are bottling up that same emotion. So in uh, psychology, it's important, and shadow work is really important. But it's basically the disowning of difficult emotions, and it's uh, basically seeing them in, in other people and sort of projecting them and sort of putting them on other people, where you see your own inner world projected in other people because you can't sort of own it yourself. You can't allow yourself to feel that you have that energy, which is sad because you have you can't you can't change something you don't own. So you have to own that energy within yourself, allow it to be, and then you can transmute it. If you project it and you see it as everyone else's problem, you're not allowing yourself to see it and change it within yourself. Okay, so uh, what are the projections? Um, so the question is, uh, what emotions have I, that I tend to disown and project? So anger, frustration. So what are emotions you might not be willing to to really allow yourself to feel, process, and transform, where instead they're bottled up and suppressed, and, you know, and they can't be dealt with. Okay, and then 
And then, how can I recognize and work with these emotions within myself? So it's important to recognize them and allow them to be, and then to, to work with them. Thank you. Yeah, isn't that a projection where you're seeing your faults into other people? Yes, exactly. Yeah, you're basically, uh, it, it, it's your faults, but it's also the emotional quality of it. So say, for example, if you have bottled up um, anxiety, you know, or if you have bottled up anger, you might say those perfect phrase to get someone else to explode in anger, and then you got in a fight with them, and that allows you to express the anger you have inside of yourself, whereas you, you kind of mentally give yourself a pass, because you say, oh, well, they're, they're the ones who are angry, because they started the fight, you know? It's, but that, yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's seeing that quality in other people, seeing everyone else is angry, and on, sort of on a subconscious level, doing things to trigger that emotion in other people so they reflect it back to you. So you can you can allow yourself to feel uh, feel the energy to sort of get a pass for it. It's sort of like the idea of um, sort of the idea of like of like righteous anger. If someone feels that you know that they're angry, that they can only express it if it's condoned by an organization, then they feel right in expressing it. So anyway. Okay, so the uh, the next one we're going to talk about is sublimation. So in the Ripley scroll, in the Ripley stage eight. Uh, it is um, about getting to a more subtle state. And it's really a lot like distillation in the Azoth, you know, the, the stage uh, six, the Emerald Tablet and also in the Azoth. So what's really interesting about sublimation is that Freud, he used it in a very limited context. Uh, Jung used it in a broader context to kind of uh, sort of dist, uh, dist Freud a little bit for it. So. Sublimation, uh, basically, Freud, of course, he's all about libido and instinctual everything. So he basically said that if there's some instinctual drive that someone has, but it would be a taboo to express it, that they would sublimate it, they would channel that raw instinctual energy into a non-instinctual manifestation or outlet, like art. So one of the big things is if someone has art or some type of creative act activity, if they can't express themselves instinctually the, they, the way they, they, they would like to, and Freud a lot of times would say would like sexually or whatever, if what they, the behavior or whatever is not condoned or not accepted by the, the, the social structure that people are living in, they'll, rather than facing like penalties or ostracism or whatever it is, they'll say, okay, well, I can't fulfill what, what I, that strongest instinctual uh, feeling, I can't express it how I'd like to, so I'm just going to channel it into art or, cre or some type of creativity. So that's how Freud always saw it. He never really saw it in any way other than that. And it's funny because Jung actually sort of called him on it and basically said, you know, well, it's because Freud doesn't understand alchemy. He's like, he only sees it in this one way. Jung said that sublimation was raising something to a more subtle state. And it's all, it's all about moving from the subtle to the gross. So as I mentioned in one of my uh, earlier talks on the, the Emerald Tablet, was I feel that the whole idea of secondary gain is that you know if you have a behavior and you'd like to change it, you need to find the positive effect or positive impact of that behavior and find a more subtle or more um, energetically higher vibrational way of expressing that. So say for example, I, like I mentioned, I feel that that watching TV and watching movies, I mean, nothing against TV and movies, it's, it's great. There's a lot of amazing archetypal stuff that's happening, and there's, there's really some great things about film and TV. But I feel like people that watch excessive TV, it's a way for them to experience witness consciousness. Like you're sitting back, you're stepping back from something, and you're just purely witnessing it. And I feel that that's nothing wrong with it, but that's more gross than witness consciousness in meditation. If you're doing some type of contemplative discipline, you're standing back and you're witnessing your own processes, your own physiology, your own consciousness, your own thoughts in that same way. That's a more subtle version of, of, um, of, uh, you know, of witnessing. So in the same way, that's sort of the young, the young version of it, is that it's a universal process. So if you find the subtle and the gross, you can find a more subtle version of it. And at a certain point, you might find a more subtle version than that as you continue to, to grow and expand and evolve, rather than saying, it's all about 
repressed libido and, express, and social ostracism, you know, the way the perfect way Freud did. So I love this quote by Jung. He said that sublimation is part of the royal art where the true gold is made. So I mean, that's really a pretty alchemical way to say it. Uh, but he basically, in that poetic way, was basically saying that's the art of it. You know, it's that psychotherapy and psychology is a science, but it's also an art. And he's basically saying that that is what makes it an art, is sublim sublimating, is finding something that's more a more gross way of expressing something or experiencing something, and then finding a more subtle replacement. Something that's even more subtle, or even like I mentioned before, even smoking a cigarette or whatever uh, is more subtle than hard drugs or whatever, shooting heroin, you know, Cigarettes is more subtle than that, but you know there's certain pranayama and certain breathing things that what makes cigarettes satisfying is certain breathing and a certain there's certain things you can do in pranayama with aperture of your mouth and certain things like that. There's certain ways of breathing that smoking cigarettes satisfies. You can satisfy in a more subtle version through doing breathing processes rather than using a cigarette, for example. Okay, so um, so here's just a couple questions. So what what are my habits and activities that I would like to change? And then what is a more subtle substitute? So like I mentioned, for example, if, if someone was, and I gave this example before, if someone was smoking and you say, well, what, what are the positive things about smoking? Maybe the person is, that's the only thing they, they give to themselves, that like a kindness, they're like, oh, I deserve a break, or I deserve something that I enjoy, or I deserve to take a break from work and go outside and take a cigarette break. Well, what if you went and took a walk around the block, or you did something, a more subtle version of that same thing? The positive version of it, or the positive sort of secondary gain, might be, you know, taking deep breaths, breathing, you know, like you, when you pull through a cigarette, you have to slow your breathing down, maybe it's something like that. But there's all these little aspects you can find that sort of the positive thing seated within what might be a, like a more kind of gross activity rather than a subtle expression of it. So it's all about looking at what are the things you'd like to change, and then what's a more subtle substitute, like watching so much TV or watching a lot of movies, and then saying, okay, well, can I watch a little bit less, and then can I find other ways of witnessing, and see if that more subtle version of experiencing witness consciousness in another way, to see what effect that has. So I'll just give you just a, a minute to write those down, jot any thoughts you might have. Even if you have just a couple words to write down, that might trigger the process that you'll have more thoughts later. It's sort of like dream journaling, if anyone does any dream work here. Uh, when you start dream journaling, you, you, you wake up and jot down maybe a couple words, and then after, at a certain point, you start to have whole narratives, and you remember multiple dreams you have each night. But it's just those first couple words, it just sort of starts the, starts the process happening. Okay, and finally, uh, so whatever, whatever model you want to work with of transformation, it's important to find some type of system that gives you both a clarity of understanding, but also has an emotional impact. Something emotional that will resonate with you. Something that moves you. Like for example, um, a lot of things about like Rosicrucianism, the idea of like being a walking question mark, that resonates with me strongly. The idea of the alchemical stages, sacred geometry, uh, all of these things, there's certain things that really resonate strongly with me. As I mentioned before, the, um, the integral map, like Ken Wilber and Integral, all this Integral work, mm -hmm. and Institute, all these places that talk about developmental lines and, and states and types and things like that, that really strongly resonates with me. So that's one of the models that I use on a regular basis. So uh, I just wanted to end with this Einstein quote. Imagine is, imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces uh, the entire world, stimulating progress and giving birth to evolution. So for him, it was all about your imagination will trigger new things, like the growth of new things. So whatever model or models you use, it's important to keep working with stuff that gives you clarity, but also inspires new thought. Anyway, well, thanks you all for being here. I know it's a holiday weekend, but.